I first of all wanted to thank the previous speakers because I'm a former geologist and geophysicist, so anyone that can make my life easier in terms of uh, logging core, thank you. It's one of the most boring things you'll ever do as a geologist. That's a, it's called grunt work. Um, my previous life was actually in planetary geophysics, and I used to correlate uh, so well logs, 2D seismic and 3D seismic, uh, meteorite impact crater. Actually, just a show of hands, how many oil and gas people do we have in the room? Okay, all right. So I was working on the Eagle Butte impact structure, which has natural gas trapped in one of the faults. But imagine faults that are listric, so salad bowl shaped, as opposed to just you know plain faulting. So you have circular faults. And I had to trace rocks, chunks of rock that were two, 300 meters uh, all around this thing that were moving around. Some of it was vaporized. Anyways, really cool stuff. Uh, so that's actually my previous life. Um, and if it wasn't for uh, my perception that uh, some things needed to change in the energy and clean tech space, I probably would have continued to do ge uh, planetary geophysics. But uh, because of um, perceived needs, I jumped into clean tech energy and uh, investment uh, and accelerating the deployment of al uh, alternative and emerging technologies because I think that's a serious gap um, that existed 15 years ago. and. Uh, there's still a lot of room left to grow. Um, so I am, sure, that'd be great. Uh, so my name is Jana Hanova. I'm a venture leader. I'm the stream lead for energy and clean tech. Um, and another show of hands, how many people have companies here or project ideas, ventures, something to do with AI that you're founding? Okay. Ecosystem services like consultants uh, and the like. Who is everyone else then? <laughs> um, so the talk, uh, so we'll be switching gears a little bit. So now for something completely different. Uh, if you know Monty Python, uh, feel free to drop some quotes as you talk to me if you're interested. But uh, the CDL, um, uh, otherwise known as the Creative Destruction Lab, I left a management consulting career for something that had the word destruction in its title. I think that in itself was worth it. Um, so what is CDL? Have, have you guys heard about CDL? Show of hands again. Right on. Okay, that, that's actually pretty impressive. Um, and yes, I'm trying to work on muscle memory. Uh, please make this interactive. If you have questions throughout, please uh, um, raise your hand and I'd be very happy to help address it either then or after the talk. So uh, what is CDL? We are a, uh, essentially we're an angel investment group. We're a nine month mentorship program. Uh, through which you can get financing if you have a venture. Uh, we're also, we're in the middle of recruiting right now. We're looking for ventures that have AI components or any kind of emerging tech components, particularly in the energy space. Uh, we've just graduated a cohort um, of 14 companies, 25 entered, 14 survived. And um, essentially, we provide financing and smart money, so uh, vulture capitalism is not allowed in CDL. We're looking for people that can help mentor um, companies along the way that have started, scaled, um, and exited potentially large tech companies. So we are, um, we do provide opportunities to raise capital. We've raised uh, about 14 million in the first nine months and still counting. Uh, so that's over a nine month program. We don't invest ourselves, but we simply facilitate the process. So we provide a platform for that. So what we're looking for, uh, or who we are, is we are looking for massively scalable ventures. We have six locations now. We are in Vancouver, Calgary, uh, Montreal, Toronto, Halifax, and our first international site just launched, uh, New York City. So we're actually uh, we're hoping to dominate the globe with uh, smart uh, investment advice for tech companies, for emerging tech companies. So as I go through the talk, if you don't have a venture yourself, please start thinking about who might qualify for this or who might benefit from this. The kind of expertise that you get from mentors in this room uh, is immensely valuable. Uh, it's completely transformed some of the mentors that have started with us. Um, we do have a very wide network. Uh, as any organization, we have a lot of uh, jargon. So we have fellows and associates. Essentially, those are our uh, investors and mentors. Um, we do work quite closely with a lot of ecosystem partners. Uh, so we work alongside, we're not an accelerator ourselves, but uh, we do work alongside lots and lots, lots, and lots of um, groups, industry uh, groups, uh, 
uh, Alberta Innovates funding agencies, non-dilutive funding, uh, any kind of uh, ecosystem partner that you can think of, we chances are we work with them. Uh, we also deploy MBA students, so a lot of our founders are actually tech heavy. Uh, they don't necessarily have the entry business skill set that is required for you to, to run a venture successfully. So we actually deploy MBA students uh, to the program. Um, CDL team, if we do our job right, we're invisible. Uh, we do also do uh, work with uh, quite a few chief uh, lab scientists, so the likes of um, Peter Tozakian. Uh, we've also worked with uh, Amy, we worked with Alex Whaley, who's uh, leading the SOTO initiative. So we're working quite closely with a lot of different type of tech expertise. Uh, corporate partners to help us keep going and founding partners. These two groups is why we can function. So we have discovered a quite, or Ajay Agarwal, the founder of CDL, has this qu discovered quite an interesting model where we're a program, we offer financing and access to mentorship, but we don't take any equity and we don't charge any fees. So as a venture, it's completely free. Ironically enough, the only people that pay are the MBA students for their courses. But aside from that, the uh, program itself is completely free. Uh, these are some of our investors and founding partners. And list goes on. We have now about 40 or 50 of them. So you have 40 or 50 of some of the most successful um, tech entrepreneurs, as well as uh, experts from the oil and gas industry and energy in general. I will leave you to peruse this list at your own leisure. All right. Um, <laughs> or not. Um, so this, this um, program centers around five sessions. So after you've um, been interviewed by uh, our CDL members, after we do your application, then there's an interview. And then if you're uh, admitted into the cohort, the program really centers around five sessions. Um, the sessions are attended by active angel investors, so not angels, but active angels. Uh, entrepreneurs as well as the MBA students. It's actually fairly difficult to get into the room, um, but because it is an invitation-only event, and is that for a reason? There's no speaking aside from the investors and the ventures. Everyone is at the same page, and our mentality is founders first, which, uh, which I am proud to say that that's the case. Um, so the sessions themselves revolve around one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with investors. So you have Rick Hugh from Vivimetrica, uh, we have an MBA student, and then we have series of investors that are talking to them. So we are quite anti-pitch, so there's no pitching. Uh, one of the reasons for that is because some companies are exceptionally good at pitching and there's absolutely nothing underpinning the company. So we provide a conversational style closed room meeting. So there's about six to ten of these in the morning. And then we transition into a large group session um, where the investors mostly talk about your venture or the idea up on stage. So essentially the question is, if they were in your shoes, if, they, if it was 20 years ago, they're just starting out a company just like yours, what would they be doing? Um, the rationale for that is, any day you wake up as an entrepreneur or as uh, working on emerging tech, there's you know, 1,500 things you could possibly be doing. And the role of our mentors and investors is to narrow it down to three. If you only achieve three things over the next two months, what would they be? And how would they drive the business forward? A lot of times, the, uh, <laughs> the tech entrepreneurs want to focus on the tech and not on the business. So the business mentorship comes in handy when um, the most common type of advice is get out of the valley of death as fast as you can. Then once you have revenue, then you can develop more R&D. Uh, these are just some of the pictures because, again, uh, it's fairly impossible to get into the room, but the, the day is packed, it's curated, um, but it's, it's quite a bit of fun. It's the best conference that I've ever been to or meeting that I've ever been to. You, you kind of come out energized. So Chen Fong described it as, uh, he's a serial gambler, but <laughs> it's, um, you have all of these investors who are putting in their own money, sometimes VC money, um, just to get a chance to invest once the company gets to Series A and Series B. Uh, these are some of the successful CDL companies. Uh, Thalmic Labs is probably the number one example. Um, I think they raised about a million in the CDL Toronto cohort, and then they went on, on to raise 137 million in their Series A. In terms of our cohort, this is uh, what it looks like in terms of graduating companies. Um, Rewant, uh, you may be familiar with. 
um, maybe a little bit of tick ticks. No? Yes. Oh, whoop. yeah, yeah, that's right. So these are some of our graduates. Um, again, what you get out of the session is uh, advice, investment, and mentorship. And it's really, really, really smart money that comes with a lot of introductions. Uh, these are some of our stats. So last year we had, uh, so I joined the company <laughs> uh, or I joined the organization two weeks before the application deadline. Um, so we had to generate a significant amount of um, applications. And this is what it like by the end. So we had 170 applications. Uh, primarily, the majority of them came from clean tech and energy tech. Uh, that kind of makes sense, given that we're in Calgary. Med tech was a surprising one to us, to be honest. Um, about uh, 34 were uh, directly in the SaaS or software space. In terms of by stage, um, if a company is in the concept stage, it's very difficult for, for us to present it to the investors. However, it's really valuable to, to apply, just so you know what kind of questions we're looking for, which means what kind of things are investors looking for. Uh, and as soon as you have uh, technology to prototype, we only had eight companies that were actually profitable that applied. So um, there's quite a bit of uh, range in terms of uh, market establishment, if you will. And by industry, again, uh, energy was dominating. Uh, medical was another interesting one, and of course, uh, the rest. In terms of who's an ideal candidate, and this is where I'm going to prompt you to pull out your business card or a piece of paper. Uh, if you don't have a piece of paper, make friends with your neighbor. This is a meetup. You get to meet them. You have an excuse to talk to them. If you have any companies that you think should apply to this or would benefit from this, please starting us know. So what we're looking for, uh, disruptive technologies that are unique. So in the software space, it's fairly difficult to have patents. Um, so trade secrets, any kind of Secret sauce, special sauce is what we're looking for. In terms of team, we're actually looking for highly coachable people so that can take, um, so if the likes of Scott Saxberg recommends that you should probably look at this sector as opposed to this one, um, maybe consider it. You don't have to follow their advice, but be open to suggestions. Quite a few of our companies have actually pivoted and have become wildly successful since pivoting. Um, so we're looking for a strong team with strong expertise, ideally balanced teams, so not only technical but also business advice, but that's not always necessary. Um, the market, we're looking for massively scalable companies. Um, early stage, so you, can have, you don't have to have revenue to apply, but um, one of the things we do hope is that you could have a massive impact on the world. These are some of our key dates. Um, so we have a live application now. The submission deadline is August 12th, but I do want to let you know that if you do know companies that would benefit from the program, again, free, we don't take equity, which is massive. Um, July 9th is an early bird deadline where you qualify to have your application reviewed ahead of time. Uh, we can't do this for all of them, but we will select, uh, it's going to be a draw. We would give you direct feedback on your application and how to make it better. Then interview day, and these are all mandatory sessions, and it's really in your best interest to them because that's where the magic happens. Geographic scope, this is again for last year. Um, the majority of our applicants came from Alberta, but one of the, th this is one of the numbers we're actually hoping to uh, change quite a bit. 15% uh, of our entrepreneurs were female, which, is, which actually, is actually quite good, but we hope to increase that number. Um, most were at the prototype stage, and um, about 30% of our applicants had a track record of attracting some kind of angel investment um, or some kind of uh, way to prove market traction. Again, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Uh, there's a lot of work that happens at the sessions. Um, the majority um, of the conversations happen during follow-up, so in between the sessions themselves. Um, we do pride ourselves in providing really good food and really good swag, so it's worth it just for that. Um, again, application criteria. I hope you're still writing those recommended names. They can then pass on to me, and let's build something massive. So why don't we turn it over to questions? Yes. Um, if you Google CDL and apply, uh, it's the first thing that comes up. Uh, can you hit next? Uh, next. Or you can click on that link. There we go. 
Yes. Ooh, in oil and gas. If it was any other industry, it would be a little bit different. Um, so the oil, energy, energy, yeah. So the energy industry tends to be quite a bit more conservative when it comes to adopting new technologies. Um, in the past, they haven't necessarily had a reason to adopt new tech because they had a lot of money, so they didn't necessarily need to find efficiencies. Uh, so we find that in the energy space as well as in the medical space, the timelines tend to be long. They can be longer. The projects can be much, much bigger. So um, I knew a gentleman who was uh, designing a new drill bit, um, and it would cost a million dollars just to generate one prototype before they could even test how it works in the field. So the size of projects tends to be a lot bigger, and the timeline tends to be a little bit longer, or it can be. Now, if you look at the digital applications within the oil and gas space, those actually have a tendency to, um, those ventures have a tendency to actually have quicker uh, uptake. So if you take uh, Rewat Power, for example, um, they, the time it took between uh, their pilot, between them just having a really good product and them securing enterprise clients, uh, the likes of Adco and Max, ATB, was actually fairly short. It took them a few months because there is a latent demand for it. There is a need for them. So it can be shorter if you apply the digital lens to the space. So, but at the same time, we do have quite a few people from, uh, that have you know, real estate wealth. They have all kinds of, uh, so for example, CEO of Spartan Controls is there. They're looking for companies like that, that they know in the space that they know because they know the digital integration with some of the tech they provide will be, will be gold. Yes. Right. Uh, so what we're looking for is companies that can have um, massive delta in the first nine in the nine months of the program. So it doesn't necessarily matter where you are, just as long as you progress. And to stay in the program, a mentor needs to actually put up their hand and dedicate four hours of their time over the next two month sprint. If that doesn't happen, the venture is cut. Um, so you don't need to have revenue when you come in. Some companies are have raised a million and they're still pre-revenue, especially in the medical space, some in the energy space. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have revenue coming in. Um, to give you an idea, so we had a company apply that had, um, I won't give it away, but around 20 million revenue. So they wouldn't get in because they just wanted to meet some people in the room. And we do have some VIPs in the room, so it's worth it to just do that. Um, does that answer your question? But, so you can be pre-revenue or um, be before Series A, ideally. Yes. There's new objectives. Yeah, the stage gate process every single meeting. And uh, for companies that are full of hot air, if they manage to get in, uh, they're cut because that shows. Uh, if the founders aren't dedicated, if they have, if they're still dedicated to their full-time jobs by the time you know session three comes along, um, the investors actually. One investor said, "Well, how do you expect us to invest? We're raising money. How do you expect us to raise money if you're not willing to invest into the venture yourself?" Um, examples of successful medical uh, examples. Uh, so I'll, maybe I'll leave it at admitting, admitted, being admitted into the program. So one of the uh, Vividia, they had an interesting, really, um, solution that map was predicting uh, aortic aneurysms. So they would take a CT developed by a surgeon who was uh, unhappy because his patients kept dying because the diagnostic software just wasn't sophisticated enough. That's an example. Um, KRS Pharma is another one. Norora is another example where they, um, it's a really cool technology where they miniaturized um, uh, a pad of sensors that could, they could actually overlay onto your brain so that the surgeon would know which areas of your brain to cut out more effectively um, and with potential tre treatments in epilepsy, depression, or any kind of mental uh, illness. So those are three companies that have applied, for instance. Um, another one was Vivometrica. They developed um, an insurance product, so they were able to predict, using AI, they were able to predict which, um, uh, it was used by actuaries, so at one point um, is a life likely to end. And they were uh, quite a bit more accurate than, uh, than any other data set out there.
Um, so if you look at some of the uh, recent news that was published on IP generation, so Calgary is actually, uh, Alberta is a hotspot for IP generation. I think we're leading the country right now simply because of the oil fluctuations, oil price fluctuation, fluctuations have encouraged a lot of on, hidden closet entrepreneurs to become entrepreneurs. There's, so there's some really interesting ideas being generated. So for example, if you look interface fluidics, they developed, um, so if you want to test fracking fluids, typically that's done in a massive scale. They've developed a nano chip that you can test fracking fluids through a core sample. Um, bypassing significant amounts of uh, investment. So uh, we also have swirl tags um, that can be applied in the oil and gas sector. They're currently focusing on water treatment um, and for rural wastewater treatment. But at the same time, they have huge applications for boiler blowdown and um, some of the other just salinity-based se water separation and oil and, ga oil and water separation. Um, so not necessarily, no. Uh, ironically enough, our job is to provide um, the people or the investors in the room that can actually put up their hand and said, yes, uh, I'm interested in trialing a uh, product. To give you an example, Scott Saxberg um, didn't invest, uh, wasn't the mentor, but he put up his hand for Ingu that developed a miniaturized piper that um, sends acoustic waves and measures the acoustics essentially while running through a pipe, and they can predict where there's a pipe leak. So massive environmental implications. Scott Saxberg just put up his hand and said, yep, come do a trial in our live pipelines. I mean, that would take about two years uh, if to get that kind of client, to get a commitment from the CEO to say, yes, we're doing this and we're testing this. So our investors are also a conduit for uh, first customers and trials. Um, to get a live pipeline trial could have taken them two, three years to generate. It happened in two seconds. You bet. You bet. And a lot of the large corporations are actually going to be in the room, sponsors, corporate sponsors, just so they have access to that. Absolutely. That's one of our roles. If there's nothing else, I'll hand it over to the next speaker. Awesome. Thank you, guys.